Micaiah chapter 3. Now we're continuing our, our study through the book of Malachi. And uh, for next uh, Saturday night, for those of you who are coming, I want to really encourage, as we've been uh, asking different ones to do um, personal study on the book of Malachi, so uh, next Saturday night and next Sunday morning during the prayer time, um, I want us to declare the different scriptures um, that God has been speaking to us through Malachi and, and, and praying into uh, those themes. Um, and so we're going to start to um, respond now uh, in a more intentional way to what God has been speaking through Malachi to us. So uh, Saturday night, those of you who are coming, and also next Sunday morning, um, bring those scriptures um, and, and declare you know, the things that you've learnt. Pray it out and pray into it. Um, and if someone else has already shared that scripture, it doesn't matter if God has been speaking to 10 people on one specific part of Malachi and 10 people get up and share it. I think that's good because that's incredible confirmation that, the, that this is something that God is saying to many of us. And um, so we're in Malachi chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 13 to 15. It's where we finished off last week. The Lord said, you have been saying harsh things against me. Mm. Yet you ask me, what harsh things have we said against you? And you have said it's futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out all of his requirements? Going around like mourners before the Lord Almighty. Now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers are prospering. And even those who challenge God, escape. <coughs> okay. So again, the background here is many in Israel were deeply disillusioned, deeply discouraged. They were losing heart. They were losing hope. They were losing faith because they're not seeing the fullness of of the fulfillment of the messianic promises, the promises of the messianic kingdom, God's kingdom manifesting amongst them. And uh, there have been many, uh, and, and, and the Old Testament's full of many amazing, incredible messianic prophecies, um, the fullness of God's kingdom manifesting uh, in the earth. And um, because they're not seeing... Uh, the fullness of these things, uh, they started to get very discouraged. And also their, their expectations of what they wanted to see happen and how they wanted to see God's blessings. And uh, so because of the lack of the fullness, the lack of uh, seeing God doing what they really wanted to see God do, uh, they get discouraged, they lose heart. Because of this, they start to get a bit bitter in their spirit. They get very cynical. Um, and they're saying, well, we've been sacrificially living. We've been doing, obeying God. We've been going into the temple. We've been worshipping. We're bringing in their sacrifices. Um, but all of these things that we're doing for God is totally useless. We are not seeing the, the fruitfulness. We're not seeing the victory that we want to see. And, and so it's totally useless for us to walk around like mourners making sacrifices for God. Because, uh, you know, we look at the wicked people and they, they're prospering. 
Those people that aren't really uh, full-hearted for God, they're doing well. And those people that really want to honor God, they're struggling away and, and they're not prospering. And, you know, um, and so they get very cynical, uh, bitter, and, and, then, and they start going around amongst each other. And God says, you're speaking harsh words against me. When you come out with these bitter, cynical uh, words uh, that are birthed out of your hopelessness, your despair, and your discouragement, um, and, and what you're doing is you're actually opposing me. Um, what they had forgotten is if they looked very carefully at this history, because the history of Malachi is... Um, right at the end of about a hundred years of God's restorations for Israel, God's restorations for Jerusalem, and God's restorations for the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, there have been over a hundred years of these restorations increasing. And so uh, that history starts way back um, with the uh, first uh, exiles returning from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem specifically, and, and that's when Daniel was there. And Daniel was there in Babylon when that, that first group of exiles gets returned. And that was a major fulfillment of God's prophetic promises. God pro promised that through Jeremiah, through Isaiah, and, and many other prophets had prophesied that. Ezekiel, um, he was most likely there at that same time that the exiles finally get released. And, um, and so here is this amazing thing. The exiles have been released and they have been sent back to Israel, specifically Jerusalem. King Cyrus of Persia, um, whose by name is prophesied by Isaiah almost a hundred years before he was born. <laughs> and uh, he gets shown his name in the book. And Cyrus is so moved by the fact that that. God himself has spoken about him before he's born. And that God is saying that he'll be the one through whom uh, the restorations of Jerusalem and the temple will start. And Cyrus is so excited about this. And Cyrus gives from the treasure houses of Babylon. You know, Babylon speaks of the fallen world system. But here's this guy. The, the treasures of the treasure houses of Babylon are given to the exiles to rebuild the temple. That is an amazing miracle. That is incredible things to happen. And, uh, and so he is, they're being supported and they go back to Jerusalem, which is totally destroyed. A total, for over 70 years, it's just been lying like a wasteland. And they're able to start to rebuild the city. And they rebuild the foundations of the temple. And they see finally, after lots of opposition, but they overcome the opposition and they see the temple fully built. And then they see the temple worship restored. They, they see the priesthood restored, the, the sacrificial system and the praise and the worship and the ministry of the temple is restored. And all of these things have happened. The ministry of Haggai and Zechariah the prophet. And they come into that season where there's all the opposition, but they're encouraging the people, don't give up. And people, their hearts are strengthened, so their hands are strengthened. And, and uh, the ministry of Ezra, the priest, and, and then later on, Nehemiah. And so they see now the city that was totally destroyed. The temple is rebuilt. They see the walls of the city rebuilt. And all of these things were happening over the space of this hundred years restoration and, uh, and now they have the freedom to worship uh, the Lord their God. And they're, they're able to live in peace in the protection of the city walls. And so what I'm saying here is they were forgetting all of the amazing things that God had done to fulfill his promises. And they were focusing on all of the other things God has yet, has yet to do. Um, and so they're focusing on what God has not yet done and forgetting what God has done. And they move from a spirit or an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude to being very ungrateful and unthankful and then uh, very cynical and then complaining, complaining, complaining.
Malachi is very much an end time book. Uh, there's end time significance uh, throughout Malachi because obviously the fullness of the fulfillment of the messianic kingdom is still for us yet to come. It has not never been fully fulfilled. Where the, we the church are still waiting to see the fullness of God's glory cover the earth like the waters cover the ocean. We are yet to see the fullness of God's justice, the fullness of the rule of Jesus Christ, the fullness of healing, the fullness of deliverance, the fullness of salvation from demonic powers. We're yet to still see the fullness. But we live in a time where we are seeing uh, fulfillment of many of the promises partially. And, uh, and we need to be having an attitude of gratitude of what God has done, because that attitude of gratitude is what will fill your heart with faith and hope and strength to press through the testings to come. Um, it's, it's an end time book in the sense that what Israel is going through in the days of Malachi, we can go through as the church right now. As we are not seeing yet the fullness, but let's not... Uh, meditate on the fullness that has not yet come. Let's start to rejoice in what God has done and what God is doing. Now that's a key. That's a very strong, important key. You see, the people of Israel in Malachi's day, God is saying, the words you speak are harsh against me. The words you are speaking of one another are wrong. See, what they've forgotten was this. They, by their own attitudes of bitterness and resentment, unthankfulness, were speaking out of those hearts, and words are seeds that you sow, and from the seed you sow, there's a harvest you reap. In other words, in order for them to see a greater fullness of all of the prophetic promises that God has spoken over them as a nation, um, there had to be a faith agreement, and then out of that faith agreement, they were to speak words of faith and, and with praise and thanksgiving. And by doing that, they would actually be able to create the atmosphere in their own lives, but the atmosphere in the spiritual realm around about them, uh, that would be then conducive for a greater fullness of the fulfillment of the promises. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? You actually, words are spirit. It says life and death is in the power of the tongue, and our words carry spirit power. It's, it's a spiritual power that either is flowing from the heart of God or it's flowing from the heart of the enemy. And uh, what happens is these people, because they're going around complaining and they're focused on what God hasn't done, and, they're, and, and they're, they're now saying, oh, the wicked are, are being blessed and the righteous aren't. And what they're actually doing is they're actually joining the wicked. They're joining the compromised ones. In other words, the words that they were speaking, the lives that they started to live were increasingly sowing seed for them to move not closer to the fulfillment of God's promises, but actually they were moving themselves further and further away. In other words, it was like self-fulfilling prophecy. But it wasn't God's heart that they were speaking. They were like prophesying over themselves that the wicked would be uh, those that seemed to be blessed and the righteous would not. The other thing is, the more you believe something... Whether it's happening or not, the more you see it. It's called perception. Mm. And so the more that you convince yourself that the wicked are being blessed and the righteous are not, it's like you see everything through a lens which can become a lie. And so what they didn't realize was they were actually, by their wrong attitudes and their wrong words, were creating... Uh, and more and more negative scenario. And uh, in the midst of it, however, the next verse, verse 16, it says, Then those who feared the Lord talked to each other, and the Lord listened and heard what they were saying. 
So in the midst of this culture where everybody was being very negative, uh, they're full of unbelief, they're being very cynical. Um, so out of that, what happens is um, they stop giving quality offerings and sacrifices to the Lord. Uh, when they go into the temple to praise and to worship the Lord, um, it just becomes lip service because in their hearts they just say, what is the use of this anyway? What a waste of my time. This has no power. When you believe that praise and worship has no power, it loses its power. Jesus says, you know, uh, as your faith is, so be it unto you. And this is really important. Even the most powerful spiritual activities, if you don't do them by faith, they lose their power. And so even though they are maybe praising and worshipping, bringing sacrifices and offerings, doing the tithes, but because of the lack of faith in their hearts, it's like, that. Oh, this is totally a waste of my money. What am I doing this for? And so, in the midst of this culture, however, there were some people that feared the Lord. And the fear of the Lord, Scripture says, is the beginning of true wisdom. I want to be a person that walks in wisdom. What about you? And so, there's these people that are fearing the Lord, and they were getting together, and they were also having conversations. You've got those that don't fear the Lord, and they're having their conversations, you know, all their cynical, critical, you know, gossip and slander and whatever's going on, and tearing down, not building up. Uh, but those that fear the Lord, they get together, and they're talking about the same situations. They'll be going, you know, why is it that we're not seeing the fullness? Um, why is it that, um, you know, God promised these things, but they've not yet happened? Why is it that we seem to be seeing these wicked people yeah. prosper? But see, same conversation, different attitude. And it's, it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks, and the heart is tapped into a spirit source. And when your attitude is correct, then they can be asking the same questions, but with the right attitude, but they're doing it in the fear of the Lord. God promised and God doesn't lie. So what's going on? There must be other reasons why we're not seeing a greater fullness of the kingdom. See, the first group are just blaming God. That's why they're speaking harshly against God. They're blaming God for it, so it's totally useless obeying and following God. We're actually... That attitude is why they were having the problem. So those that fear the Lord go, why are we having this problem? Where does it come from? We know God doesn't lie. When God makes a promise, He keeps it. There is a greater fullness of blessing He wants for us. And they, they sit down and, and it's a very interesting story. When King David first becomes king, and, and David has experienced the power of God's blessing in his own life as a worshipper. And as a, as, a, as a praise and worship warrior, and he's experienced the victories of the Lord in his own life. And so he wants to establish in Jerusalem, uh, for everyone to know that David is not the king of Israel, but the Lord is the king of Israel. And so David wants to establish on Mount Zion uh, a tabernacle of worship, a tabernacle of 24-7 praise and worship. That's the original template of the House of Prayer movement. And David wants to establish this thing so everyone knows that, that God is God. Because David goes, praise and worship is the key of my victory in my own life. And I want the whole nation to experience those victories. And, and it's the praise and the worship that brings in the presence. It's awesome. And, and this is what I want to do. And bring the Ark of the Covenant up there. And, and so David has uh, a lot of very good intention. And so David... Uh, with all the priests and the, and the army, and they start to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which uh, represents the power of the presence of God. And they're bringing that to Jerusalem to put into the tabernacle on Mount Zion. But as they do this, they're not doing this in a biblical, godly way. David, he failed to check what the Scripture says about bringing in the presence. And uh, 
And maybe David had become a little bit too um, relaxed in the presence of the Lord, but he, he wasn't fully moving in the fear of the Lord. That's what happened. And so as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant in on a, on a new ox cart with new oxen, which is not how God says you carry the Ark of the Covenant, and then what happens is the oxen stumble and the Ark was about to roll off onto the ground. And there's a man called Uzzah, and Uzzah reaches out and he touches the Ark of the Covenant. Again, Scripture says no one's allowed to touch the Ark, you know. And, uh, and Uzzah gets struck dead. Here they are. They want to bring in revival and God's presence into the nation. David has a good intention. I want everyone to be able to worship God. I want everyone to be able to experience the presence of God. Very good intentions. But he does it the way that the Philistines did it. The way of the world. Let's, let's bring revival you know, with modern business principles. Let's do it. You know, the, the way that they build companies and make you know, uh, the administration in the companies really great and powerful. Let's do it that way. And the way of the world. So David tries to do it the way of the world. That was his, his problem. Uzzah gets struck dead. David's angry at God. Scripture says he got angry at God. Here I am. I have right intentions. I, have, I want to really bless the nation. I want everyone to experience your love. And then you strike this guy dead with my fire from heaven. God, what on earth are you doing? But scripture is very interesting. It says he was angry with God, but then he started to fear God. So, oh my goodness, if we're not careful, I could get struck dead. This is serious business. And so it says, David feared God. And then David asked God, God, how can I bring in your presence? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you see. He says, okay, God, what is your way of doing this? How do you want us to bring revival for the nation? How do you want us to establish this house of prayer with praise and worship and the presence of God? How, how do you want us to do this? So, again... When he moved into the fear of the Lord and he starts to ask the questions, then God answered with wisdom and gave him wise strategies and then they established that 24-7 house of prayer and, uh, which was like the engine room of the warship that was the kingdom of David. And so in the days of Malachi, there was these people that feared the Lord and, and they're, so they're... They're asking the right questions with the right heart. Okay, Lord, there, there's reasons why uh, we're seeing the present situation. There's reasons why we're not seeing the fullness of blessing. There's reasons why we're not in revival as a nation. Can you speak to us and, and show us why so we can repent? Remember, God says, if you turn to me, I'll turn to you. We want to change how we do things. Obviously, it's not you that needs to change, God. We need to change. So when things aren't working out, if God's promises are not being... It's not because God has to change somehow. It's from our side, something's going on that we need to change. This law of sowing and reaping is one of the key foundational laws, even from the beginning of creation. And the Lord actually he created uh, human beings to be fruitful and multiply. And for us to be fruitful and have a harvest, a good harvest. That's why God created us. But we've got to understand sowing and reaping. And you see, we've already seen in Malachi, many of the people, they failed to honor and respect God as, a, as their father above all fathers. They, were, they failed to honor and respect Him as their Lord. There is a lack of honor. So if you lack, if you sow dishonor in your attitudes towards God, then you will not reap honor from God. You'll, you'll be reaping dishonor. And God says, it's not because I want to give you dishonor. I want to give you honor. I want to pour my honor out over you. But you are sowing so much dishonor in your attitude and in the words that you speak. You yourself are determining your destiny. I, the Lord, give you wise counsel. If you sow honor, 
I'll pour out honour over you. If you sow the fear of the Lord and obedience to the Lord, and I will reward you. But if you worship other gods, if you get bitter and resist,